And this is Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Coburn. And hello, everyone. Mm-hmm. And if, you, uh, if you're listening on uh, Friday and you want to tell your friends that we rebroadcast on Monday. Absolutely. And also check out writersvoices.com and kruufm.com for past shows. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's they they do that, don't they? Yes, yeah, because <laughs> the word spreads. <laughs> because we have some very interesting authors, and this is definitely one of them. And the book today is "The Newcomers Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom," and by Helen Thorpe. Helen is a writer who lives in Denver, Colorado. She has been a staff writer for the New or- New York Observer, the New Yorker, and Texas Monthly. She has also written freelance stories for the New York Times, Magazine, Slate, and other publications. Her radio stories have aired on This American Life and Soundpoint. Print, excuse me, and Soundprint. Uh, The Newcomers is her third book, and it is a very interesting book, and uh, (laughs) it took a lot of research, took a lot of time. (laughs) Welcome back to Writer's Voices, Helen. So glad to be with you again. Yes, we interviewed Helen uh, about Soldier Girls. Oh, yes. Yeah, which was about uh, sol- uh, female soldiers, obviously. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, it does seem like, like you're drawn to subjects that um, are very, very of the moment, Helen. <laughs> I like, yeah, I like finding a topical issue that everybody's talking about, um, yet, um, you know, where, where there's not yet deep enough understanding and trying to write something so that people can understand. Right, and and showing a, a different perspective, a more in-depth detail, because, face it, a lot of our media, our, our news media, is very much surface, on the surface. For sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And it's hard because we're trying to have important conversations, but we're not quite having them the right way if we don't have all the information we need. And I definitely feel like we could do better on the subject of refugees, for sure. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Was there something in particular that drew you to this subject and this angle on approaching the subject? Well, of course, when it comes to something like immigration or refugees, I'm always influenced by the fact that my parents immigrated to the U.S. with me when I was a baby. Mm-hmm. And my parents are Irish. I was born in London when they were living there, and then they immigrated from London to the U.S. And growing up with a green card and things like that, I identify with immigrants. Of course, this is the only country I remember, but nonetheless, Mm -hmm. no, I identify with families trying to relocate here to have a better life. Um, And then the, the refugee story was just taking over the front pages of newspapers as I was wondering what to write about next, and I thought, well... I wonder how that international story intersects with my own city, my own community, my own backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's how I wound up at South High School. We don't think of Denver as being a place where there's a lot of immigration. No, we don't. But I know, I know. You know, one of the one of the uh, subjects in the book even says when she heard she was going to be in Denver, she thought, oh, my gosh, there's just going to be a lot of cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> Originally from Burma. and <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure. But we do. We do have a lot of refugees. Like like a lot of, you know, uh, medium-sized cities kind of around the, the, the Midwest or the West, we, we do have a lot of refugees. And it's because our churches have been active in refugee oh. resettlement for a long time. Well, that's a good way to bring refugees into a community isn't it yeah it's a great way and and um you know the church volunteers who do this work are are their most passionate advocates really when and and i was really interested working on this project just meeting some of the church volunteers because right this second if you just pay attention to the media it seems like only liberal people on that end of the spectrum are, are the ones who are meant to be supporting refugees. But what I found just out and about with refugee families was I kept intersecting with more conservative-minded church volunteers, evangelical Christians, who were working with these families. So it, it, the, the debate, the media debate, does not 
really represent the reality very well. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I was um, I was interested in the the fact that the there's so many there were so many different uh, the, these students were from so many different countries. I mean, all over the place. Right. And of course, they they not only had to learn English, but they had to communicate with one another, and that right. posed some problems too. Yeah, I did not understand myself, um, you know, at the outset, all the different countries that were going to be represented in this one classroom that I was visiting. So I I spent the year inside a very beginner level English language acquisition room. And I watched which students arrived that year and how did one teacher teach all of them English. So by the end of the year, you know, he collected his students as the year went along just as they arrived in the U.S. By the end of the year, he had 22 kids and they spoke 14 different languages. They used (laughs) different alphabets. Yeah. Uh, Just wild that one teacher was teaching all of them um, English. And yeah, they were from countries that I didn't know were you know, some of the biggest centers of refugees to the United States. And again, the reality is a little different than the media conversation. So in this room, there were four kids from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that's how I learned that's the number one center of refugees to the U.S. in recent years. Ah. Burma's been another big country sending refugees, and there were two kids from there and two kids from Iraq, another big producer of refugees. Kids from Eritrea, another country in Africa, sending a lot of refugees here. So the room kind of mapped the whole crisis um, very accurately. Now, are these kids in this class all day learning English, or do they have other classes where they're, even though they don't know English, they have to sit in another class? Great, Great question. So because these kids test as possessing a really minimal amount of English. They're in this English language acquisition class three periods a day, almost half their day, every day. But then they do take math and they take science. But those classes they take with teachers who are trained to teach students who are newly arrived in the U.S. and have minimal English. So the teachers use a lot of visual cues. Like I remember one day in the math class, which I visited, I watched the math teacher teach the kids about slope, and he showed them a video of a roller coaster, like going down a steep descent and up a steep ascent. And then he was having them stand and hold their arms out and pantomime, this is positive slope, this is negative slope. Like if you can imagine teaching math that way. Wow. Oh, it's, it's kind of wild. <laughs> well, math is kind of a universal language. I was just going to say, isn't math math everywhere? Yeah. Or? But to explain it without using English, you know, and fairly complex English is really yeah, so the hard. <laughs> was explaining it in English, but using tons of visual cues to kind of clue the kids into what his English words meant. Hmm. Okay, so are numbers just numbers in in English, or are numbers numbers everywhere? I mean. um, so the, the kids <laughs> arrived, always, it, it, this isn't always true, but these particular kids arrived knowing our alphabet in addition to whatever alphabet their home language was in and knowing the, the number system as well. So oh, everybody okay. was literate in both numbers and our Latin script. Well, that helped a lot, didn't it? Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is, and and some of the kids were arriving already speaking. There was one girl from Africa who spoke seven languages. English was going to be her eighth language. I thought that was amazing. Wow. Well, you you say that uh, that uh, students who are multilingual earn learn another language much faster than students who only know one language. Ah. Right. But, you know, I, when, I have never thought about whether the numeral system is the same in all languages or not. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I and we don't think about that, do we? That yeah, right. Well, I also found interesting that um, there were several languages that had the same word for the word book. Very, very similar I words. I was fascinated by that, too. That was interesting. It's because I speak a little bit of Spanish, I was aware that Spanish and English have about a third of their words in common. Yeah. But um, I didn't understand that 
some of the other languages represented in this classroom, like Arabic and the, some of the languages spoken in Africa, that they shared a lot of words in common. And as you're pointing out, a lot of languages in the Middle East and a lot of languages in Africa have the same word for book, yeah. which is kitab. And it's even similar in Hebrew um, also. That is very interesting, very, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, huh. Certain words, I think, travel through languages just because of shared history and because those words are very important. So the word for book and the word for heart hmm. among, among the words that had traveled really far through the Middle East and through Africa. Well, book I can kind of understand because books weren't invented when those languages first developed. They came along later. And so as the concept of the book maybe moved from one area to another, the word might have traveled with it. Maybe. You know, I think <laughs> could be. Mom's looking Books at me really skeptically. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm not. I mean, is we have no idea how oh, yeah. really how how a language travels, you know, and and how language develops and how it developed in the first place. To me, that's a you know the etymology of words that, and how they developed is always fascinating to me. Well, you know, she yeah, she, yeah. I had to I had to speak <clears throat> with linguists to try mm-hmm. and puzzle through this myself and try and understand it better. And of course, if you don't speak those foreign languages that you're trying to understand, which is true for me, um, <laughs> it's very hard to grasp these these things. But um, some of the linguists that I spoke with really helped me understand. Like, I didn't know, for example, that in Arabic, not only is Arabic written from right to left, the opposite direction than we write in, but also they structure their sentences differently. So we say a subject and then a verb, like, I ran. But in Arabic, you reverse it. It's the verb first. You would say, ran, I. It's kind of like how Yoda talks. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Helen Thorpe, author of The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom. How were you able to communicate with the students initially why you were there? You know, at the outset, it was really difficult. Uh, Communication was pretty minimal because I didn't speak most of the languages they, you know, knew, and they didn't speak enough English. But by about midway through the year, they had acquired some English, and I would go around asking them, would it be okay if I met with you over lunch with an interpreter? And they would say yes, and then I would bring in an interpreter who spoke Arabic or who spoke Swahili or who spoke Tigrinya, Uh, uh, the language that's common in Eritrea. And then I would sit down with a student individually and just say, I'm a journalist. You know, you've seen me in your classroom. I'm trying to write a book about refugee resettlement and your classroom and what I can learn about refugees from your room. Would you like to tell me your story? And then I tried, you know, to make clear it's totally your choice. You don't have to do this. But, um, the vast majority of the kids, 21 of the 22 kids, wanted to be in the book, wanted to tell their story, which was amazing. And, and do you know the one who did not? Do you know why? Um, <laughs> her her dad forbid her. He said uh, he didn't want her to be in the in the press. Okay. So she, okay. she actually wanted to talk to me, but her dad said no. Uh, so I yeah. understood. Oh, yeah, sure, because yeah. they, you know. Yeah. You know, it, it was interesting to me, too, that English contains roughly a quarter of a million words. Yeah. <laughs> but most of us only speak, only use about 10,000 of them. And I don't even think I use that many. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's really, it's really something, isn't it? As yeah. a writer, my job is to use as many different words as, as I possibly can, but I think I'm right there with you. I'm not sure I have the <laughs> yeah. greatest vocabulary ever. Now, how does that compare to the vocabulary of some of these other languages? You know, um, I'm not an expert on all the languages in the world, but I do know, for example, you know, that, that learning a language like Chinese is incredibly difficult because um, n- not only do, do does Chinese have a lot of different words, but if you think about it, their alphabet has many, many, many more characters than mm. our alphabet. So, like, my sister, I just know a tiny bit about Chinese because my sister studied Chinese 
when she was in high school and college, and she would tell me just how hard it was to remember all these different <laughs> characters. Well, my grandchildren, um, their mother was born in Taiwan, and their grandparents speak Chinese, and their other oh. grandparents. And so they have learned some. They're uh, five and eight years old now. And I try and get them to teach me some, but apparently my pronunciation is just so bad they don't even want to bother. <laughs> uh. The only thing I know how to say in Chinese is left over from um, several decades ago when I visited my sister there. I'm in my 50s, and when, when this happened, I was in my 20s. But um, I went to visit, and she introduced me to so many people that I heard her saying over and over again, Tasa Wara JJ, which means this is my older sister. Ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I know how to say hello. Uh, Maymay, this is my younger sister. They have a different term for May -may. older sister yes. or younger sister. You can't just say sister. Right, they, right. The older, yeah, so yes. funny. My granddaughter, they call, she's called Maymay. Yeah. Oh, she's the little lovely. sister. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what, what is what is Logan called then, big brother? Oh, there's a word for that too, but I can't remember what it is. I don't know the brother yeah. one because yeah. I was just a sister. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, Maymay. Um Languages are really interesting, really, really fascinating. They um, are. I learned a lot, you know, about the languages just trying to understand these kids. But I was trying to understand their journeys here, and, and I got to spend time with some of the families outside the classroom, which helped a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with this Iraqi family, they invited me over for meals a lot, and one of the things they liked to do was to eat sitting on the living room floor. So... Because they wanted to celebrate, we wouldn't sit at the table. They would put all the food on the floor, and that's where we would sit down and oh. eat, which I thought was hilarious, but this was traditional for them. Now, why did you, how did you choose this particular classroom in this particular school? Sure. Um, well, South High School in Denver is um, the designated place in our school system where kids are sent if their schooling's been interrupted. And generally, that would be, like, because of war would be the reason a kid might not have been at school for a long time. Mm. And it's also where they're sent if they speak foreign languages other than Spanish and they need some support. Mm. So by default, then, they get a lot of the refugee students in our city. There's schools like this, you know, across the country, anywhere there's a refugee resettlement happening. Um, but South has been doing it for quite a long time, and they've got very, very good at it. And they're kind of known as being really, really good at um, helping refugee teenagers um, integrate into our society, both teaching them English but also socially helping them play yeah. on sports teams and serve mm -hmm. in student government. And um, So I wanted to watch that happening. And then I picked the beginner-level class because that's where all the newly arrived refugees were going to be concentrated. And I kind of wanted to see what is it like when you – just get to the United States and you've only only just arrived and you don't know any English and you're trying to figure out America, um, what is that experience like? Well, th that teacher in this class was amazing, wasn't he? He was heroic. He, um, he I, I love this man. I think he's extraordinary. He's a, a tall guy, six foot, four inches tall. He's a, a former soccer player and soccer coach. He um, started teaching English as a second language because he really liked coaching kids and watching them evolve, and so he thought he would want to become a teacher. But also he was inspired by his mom. Um, so the teacher's name is Eddie Williams. His dad's Anglo, but his mom's Latina, and she herself had grown up in a Spanish-speaking household and had been in English language acquisition classes when she was a student. And for her, it had been kind of an upsetting, difficult experience because back in the day, you know, students were made to feel ashamed if they didn't know English, and that uh -huh. was kind of a, a way to motivate them to learn English, but she found that painful. And so this teacher worked really, really hard to make sure the kids in his classroom would feel they were treated with dignity and respect, even if they didn't know English, and that he could kind of coax them along gently on their journey, and, and he thought that they would learn English more quickly that way. 
Well, I think that's. I think he was no doubt right, and some of them, yeah. some of them had horrific things in their background. That you know, if if they didn't find kindness in their classroom and kindness here in the United States, they would be it would hold them back because they right. would you know they, they wouldn't open up. That's no. right. They would shut down. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I did not delve in too much to the specific difficult experiences that one or, you know, another kid had. I did not want to cause the kids, um, you know, I didn't want to re-traumatize them by asking them in the middle of their school day about what they had witnessed in a war zone or anything right. like that. Right, right. Um, but you're absolutely right that some of the kids were carrying very difficult memories, and I tried to be respectful of that. And if I was curious about what their family's journey had been, I went I, you know, I asked the kids if I could visit their parents at home, and I let their parents tell me as much or as little as they wanted to mm-hmm. about what, you know, what had forced them out of their home country in the first place. Yeah, well, that was, you know, that was a that was the right way to do it, uh, to engage the parents because, after all, you know, they, in in many cultures, the the parents are um, respected and, uh, you know. People and and the students well, just like the young woman who didn't who didn't want to be you know her story told because her father said no, so she respected that. Right. right. Yeah. It it was it it was important to me to try to go about this the right way. I had been handed a lot of access to these students. What happened was when I walked in the school at the beginning. Uh, it, it was August 2015. It was right before the school year started. I met with the principal, and she said, oh, I read your first book. And that book I had written about um, young people growing up in Denver, Mexican-American families. Um, I was writing about four young women uh, who were Mexican-American, and two of them had legal status, but two did not. And I was writing about the difficulty of the two without legal status, how they you know, couldn't fit in well to society, didn't have all the same rights and opportunities, and were just struggling with what to do with that. Um, Anyway, this principal at South High School had read my first book and said, you know, I know you'll treat our students well, so you can be in any classroom in the school and take as long as you want. And so to to get the chance to spend a year inside this classroom was really unusual, and I felt then I had to really rise to the occasion and handle these kids with care because they they have lived through things that I have never experienced that are just much harder and more difficult than anything I know. Mm-hmm. So I had to be, you know, the best journalist I could possibly be and not, not just, like, let my curiosity run amok and ask them all sorts of questions in the middle of their school day that would just be upsetting. I had could. to behave really responsibly. <laughs> of course. That, you know, the principal had sort of, granted me this unusual time in the room. I was going to say I was them. going to say she had trusted you with this and so and the yeah. students and the students were trusting you too. I I'm sure once they got to know you they were trusting you to do things, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I think the principal in addition to what you just said was also she was she had a lot of faith in her students. She knew that they are very they have very powerful stories and that they are um, when you get to know them, and you know the experience of getting to know these students is itself transformative. She knew they would have that effect on me. Um, mm-hmm. They'd had that effect on her. You know, when you hear about what these kids have have lived through, you're just left kind of in awe of their strength and their resilience. The fact that they can show up in this, you know, totally new country here and and actually master English in a relatively short amount of time. They they learn it faster than their parents even. Their brains are so, you know, they have these young plastic brains that can absorb a new language so quickly. And uh, it's amazing to see them. I, 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 I was struck in particular, there were two boys in this classroom, brothers from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they arrived just knowing really mostly Swahili, but um, at the end of their first year, the teachers saw that they had acquired so much English, he let them jump over a year and a half of instruction. And in their second year of schooling here in America, they went 
into mainstream classes and started reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Amazing. Wow. I couldn't believe it. Now, we, you know, we're familiar with the refugee crisis in the Sudan and in the Middle East, but these these kids, were these kids all refugees and not not just immigrants? And what are some of the but, other things that are causing refugees? Yeah, so in this room, there were 22 kids, and about two-thirds of them arrived with refugee status. And the other kids were immigrants of various kinds, like... Um, so, so the kids who arrived with refugee status, they had been, you know, vetted by five federal agencies, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, they, they arrived with all of their documents. They were um, part of the official refugee pipeline. Some of the other kids in the room were, were, you know, kids who had just never been designated as refugees. They had just won a green card in a lottery process. Or um, there were two kids who entered this country without documents, without legal permission, uh, by themselves, without a parent or a guardian. Wow. Um, so they were seeking asylum. They were part of the, they were both from El Salvador, and they were part of that, you know, tide of young people coming from Central America, entering this country without legal permission, um, just fleeing violence in their home countries or looking for parents who had already um, immigrated to this country. You know, wow. this, this wave of, of young people coming here on their own was happening kind of at the same time as the refugee crisis. Wow. So it's... But the refugees in the room, you had asked what led them to leave their home countries. In almost all cases, it was armed conflict or war. So in the Congo, for example... The, the, the brothers that I got to know well, their family was from the eastern side of the Congo, and the Congo had a really horrific civil war. And even when that war ended, um, on the eastern side of the Congo, there were still militia groups very active that would swoop down and raid villages for crops or kill people or abduct young women or um, commit terrible acts like rape or uh, atrocities. And so it was so unsafe in their part of the Congo that there were many thousands of people leaving and walking to other countries nearby like Uganda. That's where they went. And they lived in a refugee settlement for seven years before the United Nations officially, you know, had designated them refugees and then the U.S. accepted them for resettlement here. It's just hard to imagine the strain that these children have lived much of their life under. And how, how can they mm -hmm. overcome that? It is hard to imagine, especially for those of us like me who, you know, spend almost all their time here in the developed world. It's not a life path that, that we're necessarily familiar with. I think sometimes... You know, when we hear these stories, we imagine that refugees are, therefore, you know, to be pitied, or we almost look down on them as, like, objects of pity, and we think, oh, it, it, it might be a burden to, to accept them. And I have to say, that's the thing that changed the most in my mind after spending time in this classroom, because what I saw when I met these kids was just, you know, the strength that they arrive with because of these life experiences, they've lived through so much. They arrive here and they look around at our life and they're like, huh, life in America is pretty easy. <laughs> so I'm it's sure. It's hard for them to learn English, of course. But, I mean, they've got hot showers now. They've got heat. They like a bunch of things they're not used to having. And, and they, they, they respond to life here going, oh, wow, I can do this. Like, this is going to be... This is going to be a breeze compared to life in the refugee camp where we were freezing, you know, at night sometimes, and there wasn't enough to eat, and we didn't have a washing machine or a stove. You know, so, like, the amenities of our life wow. are um, striking to them. And But I just noticed that uh, they really hit the ground running, and I, I was struck by... The difference between, I, I have a son who's 15 and same age as most of the kids in this classroom. So, you know, the, the, 
the ease of my son's life and therefore, you know, like how untested he is in a certain way compared to the kids in this room. It was very striking for me. I mean, they had been tested in all kinds of ways by war or by hunger. Um, and they were just so strong as a result. That's how they struck me. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Helen Thorpe, author of The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom. Helen, would you share a little bit of the book with us? Today? Oh, I would love to. Great. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were talking about words that travel through languages, and I, I thought I was going to maybe read um, from, from that passage. Um, Great. Okay, I think it fits with what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. With the advent of spring, as more and more interactions took place, I found myself able to appreciate in an entirely new fashion how all the different languages represented in the room converged in ways I hadn't recognized before. I glimpsed this convergence one afternoon in the middle of April while sitting with Shaney, Jacqueline, and Mariam. And just to explain, Shani is from Tajikistan, and Jacqueline and Mariam are the sisters from Iraq. Uh, they were talking about a book that Mr. Williams had started reading out loud with the class. The book was called Cesar Chavez, Fighting for Farm Workers, and it was a nonfiction graphic novel. For Mr. Williams, the story of Cesar Chavez held tremendous power. He got a little emotional trying to explain the significance of this guy his students had never heard of before, trying to put into words why Cesar Chavez mattered. At one point, as I was listening to Shaney, Jacqueline, and Mariam discuss the poster they were making to illustrate the book's contents, I found myself wondering how the three girls were managing to communicate. Shaney spoke Tajik, Russian, and a little Farsi, while Jacqueline and Mariam were Arabic speakers. They actually spoke several varieties of Arabic and also Turkish, I should add. <laughs> In other words, the three girls didn't share a common language, yet they seemed to understand one another perfectly, and they were not using Google Translate nor English. How were they interacting? I could hear all three of them saying the word kitab. What was that? Look, Shaney told me, Lang my language, their language, same. The word for book was virtually identical in each of their home languages. In Arabic, it was kitab. In Tajik, kitab. In Turkish, it was kitab, as Jacqueline pointed out. And in Farsi, Shani hastened to add, the word was kitab, just like Arabic. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it as I'm saying it, but all those words have, uh, like, one letter different. There, there's tiny variations in spelling. <laughs> wow. um, initially, I thought this kind of convergence existed only in the Middle East. But as I spent more time with the students from Africa, I came to realize I was wrong. Dili told me that in Kunama, the word for book was kitaba, and Methuselah said in Swahili it was kitabu. That was the moment when I finally grasped my own arrogance as an English speaker. I mean the arrogance harbored by someone who knew only European languages, which rendered the well-laced interconnectedness of the rest of the world invisible to me. I was starting to see it, though, the centuries-old ties that bound Africa and the Middle East, born of hundreds of years of trade and travel and conquest and marriage. Once the students grasped that I would exclaim with delight that they found a word that had moved through many of their countries, they started flocking to me to share loan words and cognates. Cobb was the word the students wanted to teach me about the most. One day, over lunch, Shaney got very puppy-like about this concept, bouncing around in her chair as we were sitting with Rahim, Jacqueline, and Maria. Kalb, my language. Kalb, Arabic. Kalb, Farsi. Kalb, Shaney proclaimed. Okay, I thought it. Okay, I get it, I thought. They found another cognate. But what was Kalb? Kalb means heart, Rahim explained. This word, it is the same in all our languages. Mm. I tried to get a better sense of the concept, which the students and I discussed over several days. 
Could you say that their teacher, Mr. Williams, had a cob that pumped blood through his body? Yes, they confirmed. Could you ask, how much cob did it take for Mr. Williams to do this year after year with such infinite patience for room after room of newcomers? Yes, the students agreed. When two people fell in love, was that cob? Yes. <laughs> I let... <laughs> I left Sal thinking that Cobb and Hart were one and the same. I used one word to refer to a muscle in my body and the concept of falling in love, and the idea of what it takes to raise a family or teach an entire class full of newcomers from around the world, and the students from the Middle East would use a single word for all that too. Cobb and Hart seemed identical. Then I looked up Cobb on Google Translate one weekend while the kids were missing me and I was missing the kids. When I asked Google to change heart into Arabic, it gave kalb as I expected. But when I asked Google to switch kalb into English, I got heart, center, middle, transformation, conscience, core, marrow, pith, pulp, gist, essence, quintessence, <laughs> topple, altar, <laughs> hip, Overturn, reversal, overthrow, capsize, whimsical, capricious, convert, change, counterfeit. In addition, the word meant substance, being, pluck. I am in love with this word, I thought. What is all this movement about? My own concept of heart did not include flip or capsize or reverse. Our two cultures didn't seem to have the same idea of what was happening at the core of our beings. There was something <laughs> reified and solid about my sense of heart, whereas the idea of heart that these kids possessed appeared to have a lighter, more nimble quality. Whatever it was, Cobb seemed more fluid and less constrained than anything I had imagined happening inside of me. <laughs> And that was Helen Thorpe reading from The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom. And you are listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. You know, it's, it's, much, more, it's much more complicated for these refugees than we can even imagine. Because, yeah. because not only to... Right, it is. Yeah, not, on, not only to, to get here, to go through what it, they have to to get here, but then to try to figure out, you know, who do they go, who do they trust, who do they go to for help, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and we don't have any idea. That our, our, our media doesn't really explain it well, I don't think. This, this book, no, this it's, book it's does. <laughs> not being explained well, well right now. And, of course, you know, some of the concerns being raised are valid. Like, yes, we want to vet people for sure. Uh, but we do seem to have forgotten that we're actually really good at that vetting process. And while in Europe they have had many asylum seekers from the Middle East walking there, nobody is walking from the Middle East here because we've got the Atlantic Ocean between mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. And people from the Middle East who come here have been through an incredibly thorough vetting process that we're really good at. And we're really good at resettling uh, refugees. But you're absolutely right that the journey they're on and what they go through and what that is like is something that we're not really fully empathizing with. Now, during the time you spent in this classroom, the political climate was uh, changing. How did that impact the kids? Well, I think the kids felt misunderstood as the rhetoric started getting more and more harsh and more politicized and more polarized. So, I mean, their feeling was, what do you mean you think we want to hurt you? We are so grateful that you just gave us a seat in this classroom. All we want to do is become American as fast as we can. Okay, we don't know exactly what to wear to school in an American high school yet, but we're really trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. and we're really trying to figure out English. We know our English is bad, but it's getting fast in a hurry, you know, getting better in a hurry. You know, all they want to do is assimilate, and they're doing it as fast as they can. 
And the idea that refugees are to be feared or anything like that was very hurtful to them because they thought, oh, no, you don't understand. We have nothing but goodwill. We're so grateful to have a safe home. These kids, I mean, a lot of them had not had a safe home in their memory. So the chance to start over here, they felt only profound gratitude. Have you kept in touch with these kids since you finished the book? Yes, I do mm-hmm. keep in touch with them, especially the families that invited me home. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it, 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 as a journalist, you're kind of supposed to, like, keep your distance and not get too close to <laughs> yeah, people. That yeah. stuff. Well, I had many conversations with my longtime editor as I was working on this book. Oh I've done all three books with Scribner, and Colin Harrison is my editor there. And I talked to him on a weekly basis working on this book. And he sort of said, you know, I can tell that you're getting close to these kids and the kids are getting close to you, and that's fine. You should just write about that in this book and write about the fact that you're rooting for them and you're cheering for them and you want them to succeed and you're trying to help them. Mm -hmm. So I I did get close to several families. And um, the Congolese family... Uh, I've I've kind of been like driving one of their sons to and from soccer practice. His mom doesn't have a car, so I told this kid he's he's uh, the younger brother of, of the two brothers in the classroom that I write about in the book. Um, his and the younger brother's name is Innocent, which I think is such a funny name. But um, I drive Innocent to and from soccer, and and I I told him I was his soccer mom. He had no idea what I was talking about. He's like, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, funny. I had to explain in this country, we have moms who, you know, just get to drive their kids to and from soccer practice. And he's like, oh, yeah, that doesn't happen, Congo. We don't have cars. Yeah, yeah. Was So you spent a year in the classroom, and how did you decide, like, what to focus on in the book, um, which is organized chronologically throughout that year? Yeah. And, you know... <laughs> How did you decide, like, what things that happened to include, what not to include? Right. So um, I wanted to write about a year in the classroom, and then I also wanted to write about the resettlement journey of the parents on the home front with a couple families. So the book is structured so that in the classroom chapters, which are kind of where the book spends most of the time, You're watching the teacher, how he teaches English to these kids, but you're also watching the kids come to life and just emerge as, like, funny, hilarious, boisterous teenagers who want to flirt and, like, propose to each other in math class and do all the things that teenagers do um, even while they're, like, learning and studying hard and, and being in school. So I think the classroom chapters just get more and more funny um, as the kids kind of come to life in the room. Um, Even as you're kind of watching a teacher teach English, which itself is kind of like maybe a more serious kind of subject um, than the hilarity of being a teenager. But I wanted to, to the reader to like enjoy the experience of reading this book and yet also witness like how do you, how does somebody acquire a second language? Then in the chapters on the home front, I was really trying to, show the burden that the parents have. So um, I spent, I alternate like a classroom chapter with a visit home to one family and then a classroom chapter and a visit home with the other family. So the two families I focus on, one's Congolese and one's Iraqi. And in, in both cases, you're watching the parents sacrifice everything so that the kids can be in this classroom. I mean, the parents are taking menial jobs. They are not having the chance to learn English themselves. They're trying as best they can, but basically they've got to work. Um, you know, they're, they're supposed to be economically self-sufficient within 90 days of arriving in the U.S. So wow. they've got three months to find a job and be off income subsidies, just earning a living. Wow. Um, and you know, with, with the Congolese family, you see the dad get a job as a dishwasher, and the older brothers take jobs cleaning as janitors 
in, in like a public hotel, in the public areas of a hotel. Um, in the Iraqi fam- family, you see the mom get a job in a factory making dental implants. And these parents are sacrificing themselves so that their kids can learn English, get a high school degree, maybe a college degree, do a better, better, you know, get a better kind of job than what they're going to be able to do. Wow. Uh, so how much time did you actually spend in the classroom? Did you go once a week? Did you go for longer so the periods of time? Of the year, my, my rhythm was about two days a week, but by January when the kids started opening up more and there was more happening in the classroom, I began going every day. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And did you take um, and I would, notes? I would stay generally for the three um, class periods or, or some part of that. And were you taking yeah, notes? The at the, were you taking notes? Yes. I, mm-hmm. I was taking notes and, and um, often tape recording the lesson that the teacher was giving that day. And then... Uh, I went, I went back and <laughs> I read my notes out loud to myself into dictation software so I would have like a, an electronic version of, of all my notes that was searchable. Um, yeah. So the dictation software would convert it to text? Well, I would sit and read into a microphone, yep, and yeah. it, it's called Drag and Dictate, and it would, yes. it would change my reading my notebooks out loud into text. So that then I, it was easier for me then, you know, to right. have an electronic file. Isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> it's <laughs> an did, amazing thing. And did you really s- an amazing thing? Start, it was a gift for me to be able to do that. Oh gosh! Did you start writing right away, or no? I spent the 2015, 2016 school year in the classroom, and I began writing that summer. Okay. Um, I did take a trip to the Congo at the beginning of the summer to understand better what the Congolese family had had fled from. Uh, But as soon as I got back to the U.S., I wrote up my trip to the Congo first, and then I went back to the beginning of the school year and wrote chronologically from the beginning of the school year through the end of the school year. Wow. And then it was time to see what happened in year two. So I did go back to South High School again as the kids returned for their second year of school in the U.S., and I didn't go, like, every day, but I just visited intermittently. Um, what, so the newcomers were all together during their first year, but then they were placed into, like, different classes during their second year, depending on how much English they'd acquired. So I was visiting, like, a couple different classrooms during their second year just to see where were the kids in their second year, like, who had progressed the most, what were they reading, or... You know, the, the kids who hadn't gone as far, what, what, what were they reading? You know, it's interesting that, that they, you and I'm assuming the school refers to it as English acquisition and how much so English they acquired. There's a different term acquired. for this yeah. around the country. Some, some places call it English as a second language. Some places call it English language learners. And some call it English language acquisition. Honestly, I don't really know why the different Mm -hmm. terms have evolved in different regions. But at South, it's English language acquisition. Interesting. Yeah, it is. I guess maybe English as a second language is often a misnomer because a lot of these kids have already two or three or four languages before they learn English. Exactly. (laughs) And English English is not an easy language to learn, correct? It's not. It is not. We have very funny spellings, for one thing. You know, like we've got a lot of letters that are silent, like we have G-H sometimes in the middle of a word and you don't say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then you have the, what are those words called that sound the same but are spelled completely differently? Through, though, yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, must yeah. Be a, that must be hard. Oh, yeah. boy. It's, it's hard for some of us even, you know. I know it. So uh, you're the... How did you decide which characters, which um, students to focus on? Right, right. Well, um, at the outset, it was not clear to me who I would be focusing on. Um, But uh, pretty soon um, after some key people arrived 
in the room, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's really interesting. So, for example, um, the two sisters from Iraq showed up. Um, I think, you know, they had missed, like, the first six weeks of school. So for the first six weeks, I was, like, wondering, who should I be focusing on? But they weren't even in the room yet. Mm. As soon as they showed up, I was like, oh, my gosh, here's two kids from the Middle East. And I know that's, you know, our news cycle's dominated by this idea of refugees from the Middle East. So I'm very interested in them. Also, it was just puzzling to me because one sister was wearing a headscarf covering her hair and Mm -hmm. one was not. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why is only one of them wearing a headscarf? <laughs> and what was the answer to that? Well, when I started visiting them at home with an Arabic language interpreter, I learned all kinds of things that I didn't understand. So it turned out um, their mom was Muslim, but their dad was Christian. And so oh. the girls, their mom had told them they were free to choose whichever faith that she thought both faiths were legitimate and um you know, it was up to them if they wanted to attend a church or a synagogue. And so, you know, Mariam, I think, identified more with, she's named for Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Jacqueline, I think, identified a little bit more as a Muslim. Mm. Um, uh, Interesting. Their family, you know, was fascinating to me because it turned out their dad had um, cooperated with the U.S. military when we invaded Iraq, and, you know, the family was targeted because of that, and that's why they had to flee from Iraq. But then they went to what they thought would be a safe country, and that was Syria, oh my. only to get caught up in the Syrian civil war yeah. um, had to flee that country. So they were double refugees. Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, those girls had seen all kinds of things, terrible car bombings in Damascus, Syria. Um, uh, So I was very moved by the drama of their story and their dad trying to help the U.S. and then that causing them to be sent off on this incredible odyssey for so long, looking for a safe place to live and not finding it and trying again. And um, Mm. uh, right around the same time that they showed up in the classroom. The two boys from the Congo showed up, Solomon and Methuselah. They were interesting to me right away because they started very quickly just becoming so proficient in English. Their learning curve was steeper. They were learning more English faster than anybody in the room. And I was really awed by them, and so was the teacher. So the teacher was making comments to me like, gosh, you know, can you believe how fast Solomon and Methuselah are learning? So I began visiting those two families at home um, uh, as soon as as the kids were settled and, you know, as soon as I brought in interpreters and met with them. About halfway through the year, I began visiting their, their parents at home to get to know them better. And then the third um, student that you focused on, Christina, has a, even a different journey. Yeah. So um, once I figured I wanted to write about a family from the Congo and a family from Iraq, it occurred to me, huh, well, Helen, you've got representation then from Africa, and you've got representation from the Middle East, but what about Southeast Asia? Because that's the third region that's producing lots of refugees. And I knew there were kids whose families were from Burma in the room, so I was trying to find a student in the classroom to represent Burma and what's happening there and that part of the refugee crisis. But there were two boys in the room whose families were originally from Burma, and in both cases their families had fled, gone to Thailand, and gotten stuck inside refugee camps there for so long that their children were born inside the refugee camp. So the boys from Burma in the classroom had only ever lived inside a refugee camp their whole entire lives. Wow. So I think the transition was so overwhelming for them. I mean, it was their first time in the developed world. They were learning English, but they'd never lived outside a camp before. So the whole idea of freedom and, um, like, 
You know, just mass transit was new to them because their life inside the refugee camp had been so circumscribed. Wow. So they were overwhelmed, is my sense, and neither of those boys really wanted to talk to me a whole lot. And so I didn't feel comfortable pushing them. Like, if if they didn't really want to talk to me, I just wanted to let them be in the classroom. We right, were We were right. kind of talking about this earlier, you know, yeah. trying to honor where the kids were in their journeys and protect them from right, my right. own curiosity and not 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 um, not burden them with my trying to tell their story. Right. If it's not what was good for them. So in the process of like trying and failing to get to know those two boys at a deeper level, what happened was I became close to one of the interpreters that I used and her name is Christina, as you mentioned. And she herself had been a student at the same high school. When I met her, um, she was actually a college student, and she was working as my interpreter Mm. with the boys. But then she wanted to tell me her story. And I thought, well, okay, instead of telling the the story of one of the students in the room, I'll tell the interpreter's story instead. Wow. And her story was, you know, kind of shocking and, and illuminating to me, like, I... Um, well, her story was that uh, back when she had been in eighth grade, her first year in the U.S., her grandmother, she had come here without either of her parents, just in the care of her grandmother, along with her sisters. Her grandmother had tried to marry Christina off at age 13 to a much older man in his 20s. Oh, oh wow. And yeah. the grandmother thought that this was okay. And Christina really didn't want to do it. Oh, wow. And, you know, the whole idea of becoming a child bride was horrifying to her, and she was fighting with her grandmother about that. Wow. And then her grandmother ended up being physically abusive and cutting her with a knife Oh. In the process. Wow. And then a teacher in her eighth-grade classroom, an American teacher at her middle school, noticed the wound and asked Christina why her hand was bandaged at school, why she couldn't write. And Christina, you know, didn't want to say, didn't know if she could trust the teacher. Her English wasn't very good yet. And the teacher really pushed her, and Christina finally confessed that her grandmother had hurt her. And then the teacher ended up, you know... Reporting that. And and her her sisters reporting it, which meant they were taken out of their home that was very disorienting for Christina, especially not with having, you know, enough English to understand what was happening. Wow. Um, well, Helen, I'm, we're going to have to cut you off on that. We're about out of time. But, um, yeah. yeah, so for your for listeners, check yeah. out The Newcomers yeah. Finding I would, Refuge. I would just add that uh, an American family adopted Christina, and she says it was the best <laughs> thing that ever happened to her. Oh, wonderful. Oh, All, All right. right. I was going to say you're going to have to read the book to find out what happens. <laughs> Yeah. Spoiler well, alert. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. This is a, a it's really my pleasure. Thank a, you for having me. It's a very important book. It is. It is because yeah. we need to know these things. We really do. Yeah. Mom, do you have some final yeah. words? For yeah, us? I do. This this just fits these kids. The scars of life remind us where we have been. They don't have to dictate where we're going. And thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Helen. And see you next pleasure. week. On Writer's Voices.